Vauxhall needed competitive representation in the growing SUV C segment, and this Grandland X provides it. The drive dynamics aren't particularly involving, but it's one of the most spacious and efficient contenders in the Qashqai class, and sets itself apart from rivals with a clever OnStar media connectivity and concierge system. This car won't be a magazine favourite, but the truth is that a lot of boxes are ticked here. Yes, it's another family-friendly SUV, and yes, this time it's a Vauxhall. This Grandland X, the largest model of this kind in the Griffin brand's newly rejuvenated crossover range. It shares all its engineering with its group cousin and close rival, Peugeot 3008, and since that model was crowned the European car of the year at its introduction, the prospects here seem encouraging. Products like this will be key for a manufacturer that's gradually having to reinvent itself. And a company branded by most commentators as a latecomer to the quickly growing Qashqai class for family hatchback models with SUV pretensions. Actually, that's not really true. Uh, Vauxhall competed half-heartedly in this sector for nearly a decade between 2006 and 2015 with its Korean-built Antara, which replaced the Luton-built Frontera model that was launched way back in 1991. Neither of these crossovers really hit the segment sweet spot though and neither was helped by brittle build quality that could charitably be described as patchy. By the middle of this century's second decade though, Vauxhall had got on board with the kind of SUV that modern family buyers really wanted, launching its super mini based Mocha model in 2012 and shortly afterwards entering into an agreement with Peugeot to share the engineering of two further contenders in this class. Uh, by 2017, all this planning was beginning to bear fruit. The Mocha became the Mocha X, courtesy of a far-reaching update, and it was repositioned just above a new Peugeot plan platformed small B-segment SUV, the Crossland X. At the other end of the lineup sits this Grandland X, a C-segment SUV that at last gives Vauxhall brand loyalists who might be looking at something astracized an arguably more interesting showroom option. Of course, to realise its production objectives, this car has to also attract conquest sales from other more established brands in the sector, so it needs something to help it stand out. Hence the standard fitment across the range of Vauxhall's clever and still rather unique OnStar personal connectivity and service assistance setup. Add to this uh, the more familiar attributes of models in the segment also offered here, uh, things like visual personalisation, efficient engines, and in this case, uh, neat IntelliGrip system to enhance traction on slippery surfaces, and the Grandland X proposition seems, as we've suggested, to be potentially promising. Time then to put it to the test. We'd anticipate that your expectations of a car of this kind when it comes to drive dynamics will probably be pretty modest. You'll want quite a commanding driving position, a comfortable ride, reasonable refinement, decently responsive engines, and, well, that's likely to be just about it. If you're after a C-segment SUV that you can throw around a bit, well, this uh, certainly won't suit. Uh, in fact, apart from, say, it's Attica and perhaps Audi's Q2, we're struggling to think of a car in this sector that's in any way suited to the preferences of someone who really enjoys their driving. Which is fine, because driving enthusiasts, wisely, tend to steer well clear of models in this class. Uh, they certainly wouldn't get any particular enjoyment out of a Grandland X, a car which makes its disapproval quite clear if you start to push on a bit at speed through tight corners. Uh, if you take a more typically relaxed approach though, uh, everything becomes much more satisfactory. It soaks up bumps and tarmac tears that would trouble many rivals, plus it's relatively quiet and it's easy to manoeuvre, particularly around town where the light steering which uh, hampers you at speed becomes a boon. Now that slightly raised driving position is delivered, but it's not delivered to the point where acclimatisation would be required if you were moving into a model like this from something more conventional. 
sensible virtues then in a Qashqai class segment that to some extent sacrifices sense for style. Something like an Astra Sports Tour Estate is after all bigger inside, lighter, more agile and much cheaper. But then you could compare any C-sector SUV contender to its family hatch originator and say exactly the same thing. In the case of this Grandland X, you'd expect that development starting point to have been an Astra. And had General Motors' European division been more profitable over the last two decades, it surely would have been. Now, since that wasn't the case, and also since GM's Vauxhall and Opel brands simply had to be represented in this segment as soon as possible, uh, this car was instead created from the uh, borrowed PSA Group EMP2 platform that also undergirds uh, two of its closest class rivals, Peugeot's 3008 and Citroen C5 Aircross. You'll also want to know about engines. That's another area where Vauxhall has had very little to do with the development of this car. Uh, the units in question also lifted from its two French cousins. That means a choice for mainstream buyers of either a 130 bhp 1.2 litre three-cylinder turbo petrol unit or a frugal 120 bhp 1.6 litre four-cylinder diesel. Both come with the option of six-speed automatic transmission if you don't like the not especially sweet shifting six-speed manual gearbox that's provided a standard. Now given the low likely annual mileages of many buyers and the significant price premium required for diesel ownership, we would uh, expect that most buyers will select the uh, petrol variant that we're trying here and that makes uh, 62 miles an hour from rest in 11.1 seconds en route to 117 miles an hour. This little three-pot is quite a zesty unit, but it's not an especially talky one. Uh, the alternative diesel gives you 30% more zip through the gears, uh, 300 newton meters of it, but the power bend where all the grunt sits is rather narrow. And this is possibly why the modest 1.4 ton braked towing capacity figure of a diesel Grandland X isn't very much different from that of its petrol counterpart. The power delivery characteristics of this unit will certainly be evident in this variant if you try to replicate the quoted performance stats. Uh, rest to 62 miles an hour in 11.8 seconds on the way to the same 117 mph maximum. Uh, if you do want more performance, uh, then do talk to your dealer about the alternative 2 litre 180 bhp diesel unit which is available in this model. As for the off-road promise suggested by the SUV styling, well, it isn't completely without foundation, despite the fact that mainstream models can't be ordered with any kind of 4x4 system. Vauxhall thinks that customers in this class don't need the weight and the complexity of all-wheel traction. Instead, the brand offers Grandland X buyers the extra-cost option of an IntelliGrip traction control system as part of a package that comes with special mud and snow tyres, but not the hill assist descent control feature that you do get on the Peugeot 3008's otherwise identical grip control setup. This optional package copies Land Rover's terrain response setup uh, in offering the driver the chance to choose different settings to suit different surfaces. Uh, there are five separate modes on offer, uh, normal, snow, mud, sand and ESP off. Now, none of this is able to make this car into any kind of mud plugger, but in combination with the useful 223 millimeters of ground clearance, it is all enough to potentially make it a good deal more capable in a snowy snap than many of its competitors. It's a compliment to Vauxhall that from an aesthetic point of view, this Grandland X very much has its own identity. I mean, you certainly wouldn't know initially that this car was as closely related to its Peugeot 3008 donor design as it actually is. British styling chief Mark Adams and his team having worked hard at developing the elegant, carefully crafted SUV brand character that's already established in the company's smaller Crossland X and Mocha X models. Now, we approve of the fact that this is one of the larger contenders in the SUV C segment too. So unlike some rivals, it can offer versatile practicality that's a genuine improvement over that of the family hatchback it's based on. 
There are certainly plenty of recognisable Vauxhall cues at the front here. Uh, the bonnet features the company's usual signature centre crease and it flows into a prominent grille featuring a silver griffin badge. And that's flanked by flowing style lines that draw the eye towards these uh, slim double wing LED headlamps that are meant to visually widen the nose of the car. Uh, there's more chrome around the corner fog lights and primary cooling is taken care of by this lower air intake further down which sits above the usual silvered skid plate. Now that is standard providing you avoid the uh, base spec and it's there to add a little bit of uh, extra SUV attitude. And from the side, well, the look certainly isn't as charismatic as that of a Peugeot 3008, but you do sense that that's partly intentional. Vauxhall's objective being to try to create a car with perhaps wider visual appeal. A firm character line flows from the wing back into this distinctive and rather intricate rear C pillar, and lower down there's the Griffin brand's usual subtle blade style crease, and that gives the flank some shape. Now, in theory, all the usual SUV features are in evidence here, but in practice, many of these are either optional, like these roof rails, or limited to top spec trim, like these dark tinted rear windows. You'll also need to stretch to the top of the range uh, for these extra large 19-inch uh, wheels. More affordable variants feature 17 or 18-inch rims. Either way, they fill arches that are framed by the usual black plastic cladding, and they're separated by these chunky sills. Move to the rear and the SUV design cues continue and they cloud the reality that the Grand X doesn't actually sit much further off the ground than a typical family hatch. Uh, the high mounted split rear LED lamps are set in a clean concave tailgate surface. They feature Vauxhall's double wing graphic and they smear round into these C pillars. Again, if you're able to avoid entry level trim, there's a silver skid plate to provide the required rugged demeanor. As usual though, what's more important is what lies beneath the skin here, namely the light, stiff EMP2 PSA group platform. This model shares not only with the Peugeot 3008, but also with another in-house competitor, sister brand Citroen's C5 Aircross model. Time to uh, move inside. Now, though the relatively low ride height scuppers any pretensions this car might have towards off-road prowess, it does make it very easy to get into. Switch to a Grandland X from, say, a comparably priced upper-spec Astra family hatch, and there's hardly any acclimatisation required, although you will approvingly note the slightly raised driving position that crossover buyers like so much. Uh, there's not much else, though, to suggest you're in any kind of SUV at all. Uh, perhaps that's a good thing? Well, probably depending on your point of view. Uh, it will also please a proportion of buyers to find that another thing missing here is the curious eye cockpit instrument binnacle layout that features in this model's Peugeot 3008 donor design. They're forcing you to look at a set of virtual gauges over the top of the steering wheel rim. Here you look at a set of conventional dials in the conventional manner through the three-spoke wheel. Uh, the chrome framed circular readout separated by a multifunction trip computer. And that can also function as a digital speedo. Above it lie the fuel and water temperature gauges. Another potentially divisive Peugeot interior quirk that Vauxhall's designers have dispensed with here is that brand's annoying insistence on relegating climate and ventilation controls to hidden menus that you have to drill down and find in the centre dash infotainment screen. Here, the requisite knobs and dials are properly separated out, as they should be, and positioned within easy reach in the middle of the centre stack. Above it lies uh, Vauxhall's interpretation of how a media monitor should look in the form of this IntelliLink setup. Uh, that's a display that's seven inches in size in standard form or eight inches if as here you have it with navigation. Now this system is compatible with the latest Apple CarPlay and Android Auto systems so if you use the projection screen option it'll be possible to duplicate the functionality of your smartphone handset onto the uh, facial monitor. As for more familiar entertainment elements, well, you'll be able to access the usual Bluetooth phone, DAB stereo, and informational features from here too. 
Plus, of course, there's navigation if you've avoided entry-level trim and got yourself a model fitted with it. If you can't stretch beyond base SE spec, though, uh, console yourself with the thought that a hard-wired sat-nav system isn't really that necessary in this car, and that's for a couple of reasons. First is the IntelliLink system's capability of downloading a whole range of different apps, including navigational ones. And second is the fact that, surprisingly, the uh, PSA source screen here hasn't been configured to work with the navigational download functionality of Vauxhall's award-winning OnStar personal connectivity and service assistant, which comes free for the first year of ownership. Now, if you're not familiar with OnStar, let's tell you that it provides SOS automatic crash response, uh, stolen vehicle assistance, and via a smartphone app, various vehicle diagnostic features too, allowing you to do things like uh, remotely lock or unlock the doors, check your oil life or sound the horn or flash the lights if you've gone and lost your Vauxhall in a busy car park. By this roof-mounted blue OnStar button, you can also contact an operator 24-7 who can help you out if you're lost or summon assistance if you're stranded. Now, for the first three months of ownership, OnStar will also create in this Grandland X a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot, although you'll have to pay for that feature after that period. Enough with connectivity. Uh, what else do you need to know about this cabin? Uh, well, the design is a little sober for what's supposed to be a jaunty, fashionable market segment. Still, it all looks quite smart thanks to neat details like this neat white stitching around the lower part of the center console and these chrome trimmed vents. Uh, the switch gear is smartly presented too, but surprisingly little of it is shared with Peugeot. Uh, the starter button and a few warning lights, but that's about it which is surprising given that this car rolls down the same French social production line as its Gallic cousin. Uh, upper spec variants get these heated leather seats and thanks to a good range of seat and wheel adjustment, getting comfortable is easy, especially if you specify the optional 16-way adjustable ergonomic sport style AGR approved front seats that are certified by the Campaign for Healthier Backs. They're standard on this top model. Are there issues? Uh, well, not too many. Uh, as usual in this class, there are scratchy plastics further down the dash if you want to go looking for them. And rearward vision, that's slightly compromised by blind spots created by this car's swooping roof line. So it's just as well that rear parking sensors are standard across the range. Uh, as on the 3008, the glove box is tiny, compromised by the positioning of the fuse box. And also rather small is the storage bin provided under the front armrest, although it can include this useful wireless phone charger as an option. Uh, the door bends, they're rather shallow too. Better is the neat lidded compartment in front of the gear lever with its incorporated 12 volt and USB ports. Plus there are the usual twin cup holders between the seats, uh, uh, the area for which incorporates a storage cubby just behind. So time to take a seat in the rear. Now earlier we referenced the fact that this is one of the larger C-segment SUVs in the class. And uh, now when you're discussing models in this segment, the magazines go on and on about the superior driving dynamics of a Seat Attica or Nissan's Qashqai. But the fact is that both those models are significantly shorter than this one, uh, 114 millimeters shorter in the case of the Seat. And that has just got to have an impact on back seat space. Now for most family buyers, having that small but significant degree of extra practicality will be more important than the ease with which this car may or may not be able to corner its door handles. Sure enough, once inside, this Vauxhall feels significantly less cramped than either of those two rivals. In terms of legroom, there's space for an average-sized adult to sit behind a six-foot driver in reasonable comfort. Uh, seat back pockets and a USB socket are provided, as there's a useful 220-volt power outlet and ice-fix mounts on both outer seating positions. Upholstery heating, too, on a top variant like this one. Now, like most cars in this class, you'd really be pushing things if you wanted to try to accommodate three adults back here. But a reasonably low centre transmission tunnel makes that possible if need be. And if there are only two of you and this uh, centre armrest can be pulled down, you'll find a couple of cup holders provided. Now, unfortunately, there's no option to get the kind of sliding, reclining rear bench that you'll find available in Vauxhall's smaller Crossland X model or in this class on, say, a rival Volkswagen Tiguan. 
So finally, let's have a look in the boot. Now above base trim, you get a powered tailgate, and it's one of those that can be opened with a swipe of your foot beneath a bumper. If key in pocket, you're approaching the car uh, laden down with bags. Once the tailgate rises, a 514 litre capacity is revealed. Now that's fractionally more than you'll get in a 3008, with the room on offer accessed through this decently sized rectangular aperture. Now this is a usable space too. Avoid that entry level spec and you'll also get this adjustable height flex floor that distinguishes itself by still being completely usable if, as we'd recommend, you take up the option of fitting uh, this space saver spare wheel. Uh, slim compartments either side are ideal for smaller items. Another design feature that's possible on the smaller Crossland X that you can't have here is the option of splitting the rear bench 40-20-40. Here it's the usual 60-40 split, but above entry level trim you do get a ski hatch so that you can push longer items through into the cabin. Activate these useful side cargo wall latches uh, and uh, push forward the backrest. Everything falls almost completely flat, freeing up 1,652 litres of total space. That's actually large enough to be very comparable with the kind of room that you get from the supposedly larger and much pricier SUVs in the class above, uh, Hyundai Santa Fe, for example. Grandland X pricing sits primarily in the £23,000 to £30,000 bracket and there's a premium of just under £1,400 to pay if you want to move from this 1.2 litre 130bhp petrol model to the 1.6 litre 120bhp diesel. And with both engines, automatic transmission is a £1,500 option. Now if you're shopping at the top of the range, you can also talk to your dealer about a Pokia 2 litre 180bhp diesel variant. And finally, we need to mention that like many cars in the the SUV C segment, this one can't be ordered with any kind of four-wheel drive system. That advantage of being able to offer optional 4x4 traction then stays with the only slightly smaller Mokka X, which is probably just as well because there aren't really many other reasons why you might opt for Mokka motoring having tried this car. A Grandin X only costs around £1,500 more, it has a significantly bigger boot and it'll be much cheaper to run. Size-wise, an arguably more relevant Vauxhall comparison is with the brand's Astra Sports Tour Estate, which could save you up to around £4,000 over an equivalent Grand Linex. So that, in a nutshell, is the premium that you pay for SUV ownership. If you've already decided that you're quite happy with that, then you're going to want to know just how this Griffin brand contender squares up to other comparable rivals in the SUV C segment. And that obviously includes the very comparably priced PSA Group sister SUVs it's based on, Peugeot 3008 and Citroen C5 Aircross. Now, if you're a potential customer looking to make wider comparisons in this sector, it could be easy to get confused and find yourself comparing this Vauxhall to slightly more compact super mini based crossovers from the class below that are more specifically targeted by the Luton Makers Crossland X as well as by that Mocha model we just mentioned. This Grandland X, in contrast, like its direct Peugeot and Citroën counterparts, is aimed at slightly larger family hatchback-based SUVs like Nissan's Qashqai, uh, Seat's Attica and Kia Sportage. Well, Pokia plusher versions of those models anyway. Uh, Vauxhall's made no attempt here to offer the feebler engines and the base spec trim levels that give those three popular class contenders a much lower sub £20,000 starting price. Now if you are going to make price comparisons with those sector heavy hitters then you'll probably find that this Vauxhall will list at around £2,000 more. And the same is true if you also compare to other popular sector competitors like, say, Renault's Kajar, uh, Hyundai's Tucson, Skoda's Karok, or Honda's HRV. Ultimately, though, all those contenders, uh, they cost more to run than this Crossland X. Um, none of them can match its OnStar connectivity options, and most offer significantly less rear seat, interior room, and boot space. So, as usual, it comes down to what you want. Now, if from what we just said, you've gained the impression that this car's been pitched in the pricey side in this segment, then that wouldn't be altogether correct. Uh, actually, Vauxhall's chosen something of a 
middle ground in this respect, uh, there being plenty of comparable rivals in this class that are more expensive. So list price wise, uh, you'd have to find a few hundred pounds more than is needed for a Grandland X if you were going to opt for a model like Ford's Cougar or Volkswagen's Tiguan. Um, uh, you could also easily spend more in this class on a crossover like Mini's Countryman, Audi's Q2, uh, Mazda's CX-5, Subaru's XV or the hybrid version of Toyota CHR and Vauxhall rather bravely argues that a Grandland X is large and sophisticated enough in its plusher guises to offer a real alternative to premium badge compact crossovers costing around £5,000 more models like Audi's Q3, uh, Mercedes GLA and the BMW X1. You may disagree. What's not up for discussion is that there are a bewildering number of options in this segment, but your local Vauxhall salesperson will give you plenty of very plausible reasons why you should save your money and stick with what's provided here. Now, one of those might well be the standard inclusion on all Grand Linux variants of the OnStar Personal Connectivity and Service Assistance System. Uh, now, certainly for us, this package would be a powerful sales incentive. Now, that's despite the fact that on this particular model, it doesn't feature a navigation download system, so you can't uh, call the operator and get a destination sent direct to the car's IntelliLink system. Uh, otherwise, though, the OnStar package is exactly the same as it is in any other Vauxhall, which means that it will automatically alert the emergency services in the event of an accident, and it can create in the car a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot. Other features include a smartphone app that can remotely lock or unlock the doors, uh, check your oil life or if you've gone and lost this Vauxhall in a busy car park it can sound the horn or flash the lights. Plus if your Grand Linux is stolen OnStar can disable it so it can't be started. Just bear in mind though that there is a cost to use the 4G Wi-Fi after the first three months of ownership and that'll vary depending on the service provider you use and of course the amount of data you want. And there's also a cost to continue with the whole OnStar system after year one so expect a fee of around around £90 a year, excluding Wi-Fi. OnStar is just one part of a very complete specification that comes with most versions of this Vauxhall. Now, as is often the case with the brand, there's a confusing trim structure hierarchy that sees the base trim level, SE, being priced fractionally above the much better equipped next trim level up, Techline Nav, which means that unless you get offered a really good deal on an SE spec Grand Linux, which is very possible, Techline Nav is the trim option to choose at the foot of the range. So, all models get alloy wheels with at least 17 inches in size, uh, front fog lamps, LED daytime running lights, powered heated mirrors, rear parking sensors, and auto headlamps and wipers. Inside, across the lineup, you can expect to find features like dual zone climate control, a leather covered multifunction steering wheel, uh, also a trip computer, an anti dazzle rear view mirror a useful 220-volt power outlet behind the front seats, and cruise control with a speed limiter. Plus, there's an IntelliLink infotainment setup incorporating a DAB tuner, a Bluetooth audio streaming, and a smartphone projection package, which allows you to access music and apps from your handheld device via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto systems. Now, even if you do have to pay a slight premium to get yourself into the tech line nav trim level, we'd recommend, uh, we do suggest you try and find it because at this point of the range, you get all the extra little features that really make this Grandland X the car it wants to be. The alloy effect, front and rear skid plates and rear privacy glass, for example. Uh, further features that add a little extra car park presence include larger 18-inch alloy wheels and chrome effect side window trim. At this point in the range, you also get ambient LED cabin lighting, alloy style door sill covers, uh, keyless entry and a useful adjustable flex floor for the boot. In addition, as the TechLine nav name suggests, a full navigation setup comes included with this trim level too, and that means that the IntelliLink infotainment system's usual 7-inch screen is expanded to 8 inches in size to incorporate it. 
Next up is sport nav trim, but there's no real point in finding a lot more to get that because the only spec difference over a much cheaper tech nav model is a slightly smarter diamond cut finish for the alloy wheels. Uh, you are far more likely to be offered a good deal or favorable finance rates on a sport nav variant though. Now we would also question whether it's really worth finding more cash for the top elite trim level that we're trying here. Possibly not. Uh, elite buyers do get these larger 19-inch diamond cut alloy wheels, LED adaptive forward lighting headlights to turn the bends, a park assist system with front sensors, a 360 degree panoramic camera setup, leather upholstery, a heated steering wheel and 16-way adjustable ergonomic heated front seats. Otherwise though, uh, the specification at this level is very similar to what you get with tech line trim. Um, if you do want to go further, you can also also talk to your dealer about a flagship ultimate trim level that will give you a trendy black contrast coloured roof. So on to options and there are a few that we'd really recommend. The affordable all road pack gives you grippier mud and snow tyres and a selectable mode IntelliGrip front traction system that you'll really appreciate in the icier winter months. Uh, you would after all look rather silly in one of these if on a snowy day you were struggling as much as you would be in an ordinary family hatchback. Uh, if you have more budget left over well you might want to look at uh, items like roof rails, a panoramic glass roof with electric sunblind, uh, a wireless phone charger and a heated windscreen. And there's also the option of a thumping eight speaker Denon premium sound system, although you can only have that if you rather unwisely decide not to pay extra for an emergency spare wheel. Four elite trim features that you might want to add in to the lesser variants include the ergonomic AGR approved sports seats. Those are approved by the Campaign for Healthier Backs. Uh, a winter pack two option that gives you heat for the steering wheel and the upholstery front and back. Uh, a wireless phone charger and a premium LED adaptive forward lighting pack that gets you brighter LED headlights that are able to adapt to the road conditions. And if you want to keep box ticking, uh, there's a detachable tow bar and on the automatic diesel models there's an automatic cruise control that uses a radar to keep you a safe distance behind the vehicle in front on the highway. And unless you want your Grandland X finished in a solid shade of Jasper Grey, you'll have to pay extra for your chosen paint colour too. Uh, there's a choice of various extra cost brilliant or metallic shades or the kind of more eye-catching finish that we have here achieved with two or three metallic coat paint. Enough about options and extras, what about safety provision in this car? Well, we're a bit disappointed to find that the autonomous braking system that comes as standard on every Peugeot 3008 is optional here on the base SE variants that many buyers will choose. Uh, this is one of those setups that detects hazards ahead and will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. Still, you can add that in as part of an affordable safety pack that also gives you three further features. Uh, sensors that detect and warn you of driver drowsiness. Forward collision alert that warns you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. And lane assist, which will guide the car back onto the right course if you drift over the lane markings on the highway. Um, the safety pack also comes as standard if you can afford to stretch beyond SE trim to any of the other variants in the range. Every Grandland X model comes with twin front side and full length curtain airbags along with Isofix child seat mounts fitted to the two outer rear seats and as we've already mentioned the standard OnStar system will automatically alert the emergency services in the event of an accident and give them your exact GPS location. Uh, in addition all Grandland X models get ESP stability control and ABS brakes with emergency brake assist for panic stops and those will be advertised to following motorists by flashing adaptive brake lights. Uh, now to make sure that you don't drive with a flat there's a tyre deflation detection system plus you get hill start assist to prevent the car from rolling backwards when you're pulling away on inclines. In addition, the Grandland X gets camera-driven features that can't be fitted to Vauxhall's older Mocha X design. Uh, these include a speed sign recognition feature that pictures road signs and shows them to you on the Instrument Binnacle Trip Computer display screen. And on top of that, there's a lane departure warning feature that lets you know if the car is wandering out over the road markings.
Okay, let's cut straight to it. Vauxhall has never sold any sort of mid-sized SUV, able to offer an across-the-board class competitive set of running costs. Look at the models of this sort that the company has produced in the modern era. The Frontera, the Antara, and latterly the Mocha. All have lagged way behind the segment standing when it came to fuel and CO2 returns, at least in terms of petrol power anyway. The green pump issue is significant because unless you can afford around £24,000 or more for a Grandland X with a diesel engine, you're going to have to have one with petrol power. The unit in question is a PSA Group 130 bhp 1.2 litre three cylinder turbo, a power plant that's actually one of the standard setters when it comes to engines of this kind in this segment. Um, sounds promising, doesn't it? Let's get to the figures. This petrol fueled Grandland X 1.2 litre turbo variant, the one that most customers are going to buy, uh, delivers 55.4 mpg on the combined cycle and 117 grams per kilometre of CO2 in manual form with 17 or 18 inch wheels. Uh, the returns are genuinely difficult to beat in this sector. Something directly comparable like a rival Ford Cougar 1.5 litre T looks almost recklessly extravagant by comparison, delivering 45.6 mpg and 143 grams per kilometre. Go for the automatic gearbox option with this Grandland X model and the figures are very little affected, falling only to 54.3 mpg and 120 grams per kilometre. If you absolutely have to have a diesel, then you'll find the PSA Group's 1.6 litre Blue HDI engine transplanted into your Grandland X model of choice, here rebadged as Blue Injection technology. Now, Peugeot offers buyers a choice of two versions of this unit, but Vauxhall customers are restricted to the Pokia 120 bhp unit, and that's an engine that manages uh, 70.6 mpg and 104 grams per kilometre, or 65.7 mpg and 112 grams per kilometre in automatic form. Again, let's give you some class perspective on that. A rival say at Attica 1.6 TDI manual model is about 15% thirstier and dirtier. It's only able to manage 62.8 mpg and 118 grams per kilometre. As with most modern diesels, uh, this Vauxhall's unit uses a urea and water additive called AdBlue to achieve this impressive result. That's a mixture that, by the way, you'll need to get topped up every 8,500 miles or so. This is something that's usually done as part of regular services. What else might you need to know? Oh, well, uh, across the range, a start-stop system is standard, able to cut the engine when you don't need it, when you're uh, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights, for example. That has quite an impact on emissions, and you'll be able to do even better in that regard in this car when, further on in its production life, a uh, plug-in petrol-electric hybrid version becomes available. As for other financial concerns, well, let's kick off with insurance groupings. For the 1.2 litre petrol model, the grouping can be as high as 15E if you go for an entry level SE variant without the camera driven safety pack features. Uh, with the variants that are further up the range that uh, have those things included, the ratings for this engine vary uh, and they vary between 12E and 14E. It's a similar story too with the 1.6 diesel. Uh, get that blue injection power plant with base SE spec and without the safety pack and you're looking at an 18E grouping. Further up the range though, better specified black pump fueled Grand Linux models uh, with that engine are rated at between group 14E and 16E. As for residual values, well, if they follow the same pattern as a Mocha X or a Peugeot 3008, then they should be relatively strong by volume brand standards in the segment. Uh, Vauxhall reckons that after the usual industry standard three-year, 30,000-mile ownership period, a uh, typical Grandland X 1.2-litre, uh, 130 bhp sport nav model will still be worth £11,025, which is a decent showing. Uh, you also need to know that Vauxhall includes a three-year, 60,000-mile warranty standard. That's a package that can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. A year's free breakdown cover is also included uh, along with a six-year anti-corrosion guarantee. Service intervals are every 16,000 miles or every 12 months, whichever comes around soonest, and you can opt for a service plan that lets you pay monthly to spread the cost of regular work on your car. And as part of this, Vauxhall offers discounts on wear and tear items uh, like brake pads and windscreen wipers.
If back in 2006, Vauxhall's previous entry in this segment, the Antara, had been this class competitive an SUV, much would be different today. The Luton-based maker would have garnered the hugely profitable sales success that rivals Nissan later enjoyed with their Qashqai and generated a level of profit that surely would have been enough to prevent both it and GM's European Opel brand being sold to the French PSO Group in 2017. On small but significant turning points like these, does so much depend. But we are where we are, in a world where much of Vauxhall's future product strategy will be influenced by its new French parent group. On the evidence of this Grandland X, that may not necessarily be a bad thing though. True, it doesn't feel especially like any kind of Vauxhall, and perhaps more significantly, in some ways, from behind the wheel, it doesn't feel very much like an SUV either. What will be most important for the company's dealer network, though, is that the Grandland X delivers the fundamentally strong engineering and technology of its Peugeot 3008 donor design and packages it all up in a conservatively elegant proposition that are quite a few potential customers might well prefer. True, the drive dynamics on offer here aren't especially entertaining, but approach almost any car in this segment expecting that and you're liable to be disappointed. Media connectivity seems to be a higher priority for many lifestyle SUV buyers these days, and if that's true for you, then this car's clever OnStar personal connectivity and service assistant package will be a major showroom draw, taking the whole uh, in-car media concept one stage further. Conventional navigation systems are, after all, only any good if you know where you want to go. Um, what happens if you don't? Say you're driving along and you need a restaurant or a fuel station just off road. Or if you're entering a town or city and you need to find a car park or a train station. OnStar deals easily with all such scenarios as well as covering you for breakdown, for accident, for theft and vehicle diagnostics. We think it's a great tool to have. And in summary, well, this isn't any kind of class leader, but it's a product that's been carefully thought through, bringing together virtually all the things that family buyers prioritise in this segment in a well-judged and relatively affordable package. Now, we also think that the development team have done well to give this product a look and feel that is so distinct from that of its French cousins. Going forward, achieving that level of distinction will be vital if there's to be a compelling case for the long-term survival of the Vauxhall brand. So yes, this is a useful first step towards a very different kind of future for the Griffin maker. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. <laughs>